My life is a joke! Oh, shut up! I mean, really. I spend my day driving a Nissan Sentra, one of the worst cars ever to crest the hilltops of undignified failure. And what happens on my drive home? What happens? Guess. I get damn near run off the road by a different Nissan Sentra of the same generation! I mean, these were twins, except the one that cut me off trying to zipper merge into a lane that was ending. It had some weird bumper sticker that looked like a symbol for a band I never heard of and nobody else would have. And Lord knows I wasn't about to tailgate them to read what the text underneath said. As far as I'm concerned, they could kiss my fart garage because it had me crabby enough to empathize with people who road rage, even as I can't fathom ever being upset enough to do anything about it. I mean, what is it with Nissan? Dude, like, what is it? What is their problem? Why is this happening? Is Big Ultima Energy the new cooties? Like, what are we doing here? Because Nissan was good at one point, you know? And not just the laughing stock of the Roast My Car subreddit. But to get there, we need to talk about one of the worst cars I have ever driven in my entire life. Me. The guy who likes everything. And yes, I even found some redeeming qualities in this, and I'm going to talk about them, but for the most part, I'm struggling to think of a car that filled me with this level of uh, of despair, you know? Not even the Ultima had me this deep in my feelings, although I would argue I rag on Ultimas far less than the average automotive journalist. Nissan Ultima's the kind of car to get a moving violation while it's still parked. Nissan Altima's the kind of car to get stolen and then brought right back. Nissan Altima's the kind of car to turn your spirit animal to roadkill. Nissan Altima's the kind of car to make a Chevy Cavalier seem attractive. Nissan Altima's the kind of car to tell yo mama jokes to people he just met. Nissan Altima's the kind of car to run out of gas while it's swerving to go around your big ass mama. Nissan Altima's the kind of car- Okay, I rag on Altima's less than Brian, at least. But what is it about the Nissan Sentra that puts it beneath the Altima in my estimation of disposable cars? Well, I'm Nick Roman, this is Race to the Bottom, and we have ourselves a 2015 Nissan Sentra SV. Unfortunately. The giveaway for this Firehawk clone WS6 Trans Am ends this coming Wednesday. That's this Wednesday. Last chance to get entered. Click the link in the description. Go to go.getentertowin.com slash regular cars, buy a mug or a digital download, and someone's gonna win this. You're helping out regular car reviews, and you're helping to send us to Australia in 2024. So click on the link in the description. Go to go.getentertowin.com slash regular cars, buy a mug, digital download, and someone's gonna go home with 400 horsepower. Welcome to the Nissan Sentra SV, and trust me when I tell you, I've seen enough people on Facebook coming up with derogatory names for what the SV stands for, that I don't think I need to add anything other than what it actually stands for, which is standard value, which in a way kind of seems even more ridiculous than something like subprime vehicle, or sorta of vapid. Uh, yeah, that wasn't really that good. But hey, if I'm honest, I, I can't think of a car whose name is more reflective of what it gets you without the S standing for substandard. Because a standard value is more or less what you get here, although how much of an actual value is up for debate. You see, this is the economy car aimed squarely at your Corollas of the world. And look, don't let the look of the car fool you, because Chris has taken immaculate care of this thing. It looks great. But I mean, they always said the devil would be attractive, you know? This is the car for every person who signed up for a civics class in college thinking they were going to learn about chrome accents and negative camber. It's a car you could have new for below $20,000 in 2015, depending on trim level. But economy isn't just about price. It's about value for what you're getting. And good lord is this standard. It's like Nissan said, what can we make that will cost us the least amount of money that we can convince people to buy because we're able to sell them on the fiction that the auto loan will only take five years to pay off? And then they dumped out this, without really thinking of how it damages any hope of Nissan reacquiring their reputation for affordable, reliable cars. But then maybe they never 
really had that reputation. Or maybe it's been so long since they plausibly had it that it feels like some fever dream to imagine a time where Nissan wasn't a punchline. So let's finally get around to talking about this car. The Nissan Sentra runs on a 1.8-liter four-cylinder, making about 140 horsepower from factory and 128 pound-feet of torque. Fuel economy is in the neighborhood of 29 City and 39 Highway, and if something nice can be said about this car, it's probably that. And also the interior trim. I mean, it's not as if it's fashionable, but I did appreciate the cloth door panel liners with the stitching and all that. But again, I'm a remarkably simple guy, which should theoretically translate to my being more forgiving of the driving experience here, right? But what we have here is absolutely zero power. Figuratively. I mean, obviously there's power, but there might as well not be here, you know? Chris, he went to this from a Chevy Impala, and it says a lot that this is significantly worse. I jam my foot to the floor, and I'm waiting for something to happen, and it's like setting off a firework that got wet, you know? It's just nothing is happening, and you can wait all day, nothing is going to happen. It hits the range that it's comfortable hitting, and then it just holds there. And I'll admit, there are moments that are kind of alright, but for the most part, you would expect more from just about any car that deigns to have a sport mode. Not this, though. In addition to handling that's simultaneously a wet noodle and way too uncooperative, you get the feeling that you're driving something that is at least 15 years older than it is. Chris purchased this in January 2022, and by his own admission, he wasn't in his right mind when he got it. He was grieving the death of a family member. He needed a car, but he just wasn't in the headspace to make that decision. And I get it. You have a responsibility you need to take care of, but grief has warped your mindset so badly that you just want it over with, and you're not really considering what it is you're doing. When we lose people we love and the march of time continues and our responsibilities pile up, we just want to get those things over with so we can go back to grieving. Because grief accelerates healing, in theory. But what happens once you've healed? You're left with the damage wrought during that grief. And so now Chris has a Nissan Sentra that the previous owner got rid of solely because the warranty ended. He knows it's bad. I know it's bad. And I see no utility in giving the guy a hard time about it, especially when I'm in absolutely zero, zero position to talk. But I bring it up not only because it's a part of Chris's ownership story, but because it also illustrates how the Nissan brand has become almost synonymous with being at a low point in your life. And maybe it's not the company's approach to do this, you know? Maybe it's the dealerships who will approve people for nothing else but a Nissan, and then have them pay loans with APR into the double digits. People are getting bent over a barrel and being told they're getting a great deal. Good people. Smart people. Vulnerable people. It doesn't matter. It can honestly happen to anyone. What Nissan thinks they have here is not what Nissan actually has here. What Nissan thinks they have here is something people can buy short term and then upgrade in a few years to the latest model year, like trade it in, while previous model years go back into circulation as the econo shit box of choice for the used car market. Except there's no real chance for this to become a cult classic in another 15 years. Because it's just not good enough to earn that kind of protective fan base. It'll be a curiosity from a time in which society lived under a shared delusion that this was acceptable. I'm having trouble getting past understanding what the point of this car is. Because I feel like Nissan built something that doesn't actually address any of the needs of a person who would be in the market for a car like this. It doesn't have a lot of room. It doesn't have great reliability in the reputation of its transmissions. I mean, these CVTs are notoriously bad. And I know, I haven't spent enough time with it to know for a fact that that's going to be the type of experience Chris ends up getting with this car, but I already know that it hasn't been great. And from experiencing this transmission, I can tell you firsthand, it is not great. 
This is a sluggish car, and while the fuel economy is pretty damn good, I don't feel like that's enough to justify just how low-grade the ride quality is. The main thing to recommend about this car is the fact that it's cheap. That's it, really. But how cheap is it if it's not reliable? Because Chris told me about plenty of times that this car has given him trouble, ways in which it hasn't been reliable. And in driving this car, I can understand that because I can feel it creating mechanical anxiety in me because it doesn't feel right. It feels like something is wrong. And yet you look at it, you look under it, you look around, you look in the engine bay, you look under, it's like, it looks fine. It definitely looks fine. And it doesn't seem like anything is immediately wrong, but there's just something off. It's a very uncanny sort of car. It's like the first kiss you have with someone after getting out of a long relationship. Like, you know, intellectually you should be moving on but it feels wrong. It feels off because it's not the person that you were used to kissing because you thought you were going to be with that person forever. And unfortunately, you know, things didn't work out. And now you're putting yourself back out there. You're back on the horse again. You're doing it. But it's always going to feel strange when you thought you were only going to be kissing one other person forever. But now you're being painfully and sharply reminded that not every pair of lips feel the same. The Nissan Sentra feels like a car that was created to address a specific need, but then didn't actually cater to any of those needs. It's as if the only real need that got addressed was the expense of owning it in the first place. It's like Nissan wanted to get into the compact and subcompact economy car market, but didn't actually want to be perceived as an economy car brand. So they didn't really do the legwork to make a good economy car. I mean, I feel like I'm explaining this really badly. Um, let me try to think of another way to put this. You ever hear the story of Arlo the Baker? Of course not, because I just made him up right now. You see, once upon a time, there was a baker named Arlo, and he was at his father's bedside as the old man was in the final throes of a painful death. And his father told Arlo, Arlo, my only child, my son, you must promise me that our family line will not end with us, that you will be fruitful and multiply that there will be so many of us that our family name spreads far and wide as if carried on the wind. And Arlo said, I promise, father, by the gods I swear it. However many gods I need to swear it on, I'll, I'll totally, I'm, I'm gonna totally do that for you. And so Arlo's father said, thank you, my boy. Thank you. Blech. And so Arlo's father passed away peacefully, safe in the knowledge that his son would keep the bloodline going. Now, after mourning his father for an acceptable period of time, Arlo set out to keep the promise he made to the old man. And he was going to do it by marrying the most beautiful woman in their village, a woman so punishingly beautiful, even the king was smitten. Surely they would have beautiful children, and the woman's renown would carry their family name to every region of the kingdom, as if upon the wind. But this was easier said than done. Arlo was a simple baker. He had no riches of which to speak. He had no huge dick or anything like that. Tell them that. And he frankly wasn't much to look at either. But Arlo had resolve, and so he mastered his nerves and struck up a friendship with the woman. Hey, baby. They talked about bread. Yes. They talked about family. Is that your brother? They talked about life. Huh? He asked her what her favorite music was, and he taught himself a musical instrument, and he practiced and practiced until he could play any song by ear, and then he serenaded the woman with her favorite music. Arlo asked her what her favorite meal was. She told him, and so he set out into the forest, gathered the freshest ingredients, and prepared the most elegant feast the woman had ever seen. He asked her what moved her heart, 
and the woman said that the poems of the wandering bard had always plucked her heartstrings. And so Arlo studied the works of the wandering bard, supplemented that knowledge with the works of other great poets, and supplemented that with everything he had learned of this beautiful woman through their long, endearing friendship. Her family, her past, her hopes, her dreams. Arlo constructed a poem so penetrating in its poignancy that the woman wept and declared her love for Arlo right then and there. The wedding was a week later. The entire village was celebrating with them. Tankards of wine were flowing, and the butcher made roasts bigger than the gendered wage gap of whatever era this story is taking place in. Arlo was ready to consummate the marriage and fulfill his promise by siring offspring. As his wife beckoned him to their marriage bed, Arlo asked to be excused for a moment. He had spent so much time dancing at the wedding reception that his trousers developed the first recorded case of what would later be known as swamp ass. There was a small creek behind his cottage, and so Arlo wanted to go freshen up before getting down. But as Arlo left the safety of his cottage, he found a band of armed men outside his door, Hunt, bread boy. wearing the crest of the jealous <laughs> king who coveted Arlo's wife. The men drew their swords I'm God. and hacked Arlo to bits. How about you? Truly, had the baker been holding one of his own loaves during the attack, sliced bread would have been invented that very day. The doctors, the surgeons, and medicine men of the village came to Arlo's aid, but it was too late. Uh -uh. The humble baker was dead, as his newlywed wife, now made newly widowed, wept over his ruined body. Arlo ascended to the pearly gates, and there met his father, who embraced him warmly. It hurts me to see you here, my son, such a short number of years after I last saw you. Come, tell me, did you fulfill the promise? Is our family line secure? Arlo met his father's eyes. Father, I have arrived in heaven, but to say this now is to render this beautiful realm to a hell of my own creation, for I have failed. Our bloodline is ended. With a deep creased, mournful expression, the father took his son by the shoulders, and with his stern fatherly voice said arlo what the fuck you had one job two jobs if you count the whole baker thing i've been dead for like two and a half years what were you even doing down there father i did everything i could i courted the most beautiful woman in our village a woman so stunning that even the king was smitten it took me a great many trials to win her hand but she agreed to have me and we were married we were in love, father, but the jealous king had me slain before I could consummate our marriage and sire a legacy. It isn't my fault, father. Arlo's father let out a sigh, and, with a great slackening of his shoulders that could only signal the kind of seismic disappointment normally reserved for sons and bad lovers, said to his only son, who ever said anything about getting married? Okay, so it's kind of a shaggy dog story, but not really, because the story of Arlo the Baker is a guy who listened not to understand, but just to respond, to go do something, and in so doing, missed the point. Just like the Nissan Sentra misses the point. Being an economy car isn't just about being affordable, it's about durability. The idea that, yeah, it's cheap, but also you're not going to need to replace it in the next five years. It's not going to bleed you dry in a death by a thousand cuts with every little leak and blown valve and transmission issue. But here we are, staring down the barrel of a car that platforms despair. But here's the thing. It's not even like the Sentra was always a bad car, or that Nissan was always a bad brand. The 350Z, the Silvia, the 240SX, the R32, R34, the 300ZX Z32, which remains, in my opinion, one of the most attractive cars of that era. What can I say? I'm a very simple man. Basically, Nissan knew what they were doing, and they were doing it at a high level for a period of time. 
So then the question becomes, how did they end up where they are now, with reliability in the toilet and a reputation that sees any number of Facebook pages dedicated to the crappy build quality and community of terrible drivers for whom that build quality is not a deal breaker? Well, Nissan used to have trouble turning a profit for the same reason that your small town's best-kept secret restaurant has trouble turning a profit. It doesn't matter if your restaurant uses the best, the freshest, the most expensive ingredients you can buy if you have a steady, yet ungrowing, base of people willing to eat there. By the late 90s, Nissan was struggling because they were outspending their ambitions. The cars were good, but they were being outperformed in the marketplace. And for a while there, it really seemed like the automotive Grim Reaper was going to come knocking at Nissan's door. But then, of all companies, Renault swoops in on a magic unicorn that comes frosting and they say, Join us, and we'll make you an international force again. We're Renault! But what happens? Well, the minute they merge, Carlos Ghosn decides build quality is for p****s and everything is getting a CVT. And also, we're going to redesign all of our stuff and get rid of some things people liked and create a whole bunch of new products nobody asked for. We're gonna make Missing the Point cool again if it's the last thing we do, brother! And that's exactly what they did. Because Nissan's reputation may be garbage right now, but damn it, people are buying them. In a very Ferengi sort of way, they sacrificed quality at the altar of profit. But isn't this kind of the modus operandi of any time a merger happens where one company swoops in to, air quotes, save another one? It follows off of the third rule of acquisition. Never spend more for an acquisition than you have to. And in acquiring Nissan, Renault essentially did what GM did with Saab get the rights to the intellectual property, I guess, and then make their own sort of cars that just happen to have the name of the company they absorbed, so that any of the character that had been in the brand before and in their products before is no longer really all that evident. Or worse, the character and identity of the absorbed brand gets diluted and diluted over time to where people forget that the brand ever had a character or identity of its own. Nissan has just always been what it is now. That they are what Renault made them. And look, I can't blame it all on Carlos Ghosn. And never mind what ended up happening to that guy. And trust me, after this next RCR story, his time is coming. But the fact of the matter is that Nissan has been fighting a public perception battle that's so uphill, not even Sisyphus wants any part of it. And the Sentra is representative of that struggle. In researching this online, I've found any number of theories as to why Nissan has taken a plunge over the past two decades, and yeah, it all comes back around to Carlos Ghosn, again and again, the CEO who's a fugitive from justice. One of the better theories that I read, and I wish I could remember where I read it, but I scanned over so many documents that I just, ugh, I lost track and I'm sorry, but it basically amounted to how Ghosn stripped away Nissan's Japanese identity through the erosion of its domestic leadership. Operations were relocated out of Japan, and not just assembly either, but research and design. There's a wholesale dilution of the Japanese national character embodied in JDM cars, so that you go from cars that have this this specific character to them, and that are made with mechanical sustainability, and then you end up with cars that sell, but it's not really doing anything for your reputation, because it's not like you're selling so many of them that you can outpace, uh, you know, whatever the highest selling sedan is right now, probably like a Corolla or something, or maybe it's like a, a Tesla or a 7 Series, I don't know. But it really doesn't help that the commitment to volume over quality created this sunk cost issue where Nissan had to incentivize dealers to sell, sell, sell. But then those incentives made the cars less profitable when they did sell, because if you promise bonuses for meeting sales quotas, you have to deliver on those bonuses, even if the only way the dealers hit those quotas is by selling off the rest of the inventory at liquidation prices on the last days of the month. The higher the sales quotas mandated by Nissan, the more cutthroat the dealers had to get in order to get those vehicles out the door. It created a vicious cycle. Not even the most black-hearted capitalist could justify this ideology for a Nissan Sentra. And yet, that's the kind of crapsack world we're living in. 
This is what the auto industry is now. Maybe it always was. I don't know. But you're given a choice. And while it is nominally a choice, it's not really a choice. Take out a loan to finance a tech-forward kidney bean on wheels? Or take out a second mortgage and buy a current model year car that locks half its features behind a paywall in a dystopian preview of a future where we're locked out of working on our own cars? It's the worst binary choice this side of a human centipede. And this drive sure as hell doesn't help convince me that this car is some overlooked gem. Let me, let me get back to this, because, you know, never mind that I hate these seats. They're just stiff, like those old school chairs with the desks attached that always made your ass itch. Or I guess technically they were desks with chairs attached, whatever. And even while it has the interior space you'd expect from a sedan, no more and no less, I still found myself feeling cramped. But this was all just a prologue to the drive itself, which is about as close as I've come to that old anxiety I had with my Mustang of being in a car that you know is going to give you a hard time, that could fail at any moment because you can just feel it in the rattling and in the lack of any structural rigidity, that feeling that this is a car that is assembled and whole and not going to just die on you at a given moment. It's that old anxiety of being worried about when you're going to have to pull over and call a tow truck, where every shard of sunlight that hits the dashboard sends an errant eye downward to confirm it's just the sun and not a check engine light. I don't think I was clear enough about this before, but the acceleration is dire. Normal, sport mode, it didn't matter. Top of the rev range, I, I found it hard to believe the speedometer was telling the truth. Even in sport mode, I struggled to merge from a dead stop. And I gave myself a wide berth. Wide enough that I should have been comfortably clear of any oncoming traffic by the time I was at speed. Yet, by the time I was at speed, the car that had been approaching from about half a mile down was practically on top of us. And yeah, maybe it's because they were driving fast. But I was supposed to be driving fast too. This thing is dangerous. And that's the thing, sport mode gives you the best merge. But with these transmissions having the reputation that they do, you almost can't use sport mode too often. It's a car you have to drive hard, but it's a car you can't drive hard. It's a money pit that gives you no pleasure for the sacrifice. And I know, I'm a hypocrite. I sank money into a V6 Mustang for nearly 10 years, and now I drive a Camry so plain that vagrants don't even hit me up for change anymore. I am a hypocrite. Run it back. I am a hungry, hungry hypocrite. But being a hypocrite makes me uniquely qualified to declare this car is hot garbage. With its whimpering acceleration and stiff seats with stiffer bolsters and negligible lumbar support. With its flimsy materials like weather stripping that's stripping like something that strips. I'm sorry, I'm out of words. It's really only fun to drive in comparison to crawling on the ground in the car show lot after everybody else leaves, dragging your balls through gravel and broken glass and leaked differential fluid. Sport mode on a Sentra is basically just vanilla thunder. Nissan Sentra. I'm not irresponsible enough for an Altima, but not self-assured enough for a Corolla. And yet. Yes, there is an and yet. <laughs> because I will always find something to maybe be positive about. And yet, I struggle to truly write this car off entirely. Because it's economical in a way that appeals to a certain side of me, even as I understand that something like this probably ends up costing more in the long run. But in a vacuum, I get it. It's unserious and deeply simplistic. It wears its cheapness like a badge of honor. It was never meant to be here for a long time. You're supposed to get rid of these cars, I suppose. You're supposed to run it into the ground and then abandon it the minute a better option comes up, provided that you're in a position where you can go with the better option at some point. In a way, with the Nissan Sentra, what you see is what you get. And there is some value in that, right? It feels modern, I guess. Kind of has that appearance. It sort of looks current. Chris has kept this in amazing condition. It feels like a contemporary car, for better and for worse. I mean, once it does get up to speed, 
There are moments where the ride isn't that bad. There are moments of breakthrough acceleration here, moments of smooth travel, the feeling that there are the bones of a genuinely good car underneath all this indolence, all this apathy, all this feet up on the desk eating a pickle sandwich and scrolling DraftKings laziness, all the corporate jargon of executives who don't really understand the needs of modern drivers who go down to their production plant, put on a hard hat for appearances, takes a look at everything that's going wrong, and just unfurls an upturned Crypt Keeper thumb and tells them to keep doing what they're doing. You see, no matter how economical something is, it all comes back to the simple point that you can't make origami with cut corners. At least I don't think you can. And the same is true of cars. In these idle moments where the road met the surface horizon of expectation, brief as those moments may have been, I feel a sort of mournfulness for what this car isn't, and an open resentment for everything it is. But do I hate the Nissan Sentra? (sighs) Not really. It doesn't merit the energy worth hating, you know? It is what it is, and it is what it's going to be. Right now, this isn't falling apart, and I consider that a kind of blessing in itself. But then, I can't rag on it just because it might fall apart in the future. Because you can't judge a car for what might happen. Plenty of Nissans go for 200, 300,000 miles, I don't know. They, any car has the potential with maintenance to keep going. I mean, I can't write it off for a CVT that hasn't failed yet, or an engine that hasn't grenaded already. It'd be the automotive equivalent of Minority Report, drivers demanding justice for things that haven't happened. Then again, that more or less describes 90% of all road rage. Damn Nissan Sentra drivers. Alright, I have now done five cars for Race to the Bottom, so I'm going to arrange this in a bottom five list. This also means that any cars that I review in the future, you know, some might make it onto the list and some might not be bad enough to warrant inclusion. So let's get it started. In my number one spot is still the Ford Escape, which I'm still kind of surprised I liked as much as I did. I really wasn't expecting to like that car at all, but eh, you know, sometimes life gives you... What's the opposite of lemons? At number two is the Kia Forte GT. At number three, the Hyundai Tucson Hybrid. And now comes the hard part, because I remember the Jeep Grand Cherokee Laredo. It was the first car that I did for Race to the Bottom back when I was still calling it Hate Hunt. And I'm making it sound like I've been doing this series for years when really it's only been a couple of months. But no car has been able to beat it yet. And while looking at the Nissan Sentra, I mean, I have to be honest. And so, while I was thinking about it, I came to the realization that yes, absolutely, the Nissan Sentra is worse than the Jeep Grand Cherokee Laredo. So that means the Jeep Grand Cherokee Laredo moves to the number four spot, and we have a new leader in the race to the bottom, the Nissan Sentra SV. And yet there's a catch, because while I didn't like the Sentra, I didn't hate it either. And that's kind of the goal of this whole series, is for me to find something so irredeemable that not even my natural, inborn positivity could find something good to say about it. And so the race to the bottom must continue, (laughs) or it's going to continue. I have another episode coming at the end of the month as sort of a bonus feature. It might even be our Thanksgiving special, depending on how soon I could have it wrapped. But if you think you have the car that can win the race to the bottom, send me an email at regularcarstheroman at gmail.com. Include photos of your car if you got them, along with your name and whether or not you're willing to drive to southeastern Pennsylvania, because unfortunately, those are the only types of submissions we can really entertain at the moment. I'd like to thank Chris for being such a good sport about everything, and for generally being a really cool guy. I've been very blessed in that everybody I've gotten to work with for RCR has been really cool. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it. Have a great week, everyone. And I will take this Nissan car with 7,000 AP.
NPR. Oh, my auto life is through. Nissan got me screwed. Nissan got me screwed.